Section 16 of Roman History, the Early Empire by William Wolfe Capes. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 8. Vitellius, A.D. 69. Aulus Vitellius had only a short term of power, but it was long enough to mark perhaps the lowest depth to which elective monarchy has ever fallen his father lucius had done good service as a soldier but he came back to rome to disgrace his name by mean and abject flattery of the ruling powers to pay his homage to the divine caligula he veiled his beard and bowed to the ground in silent adoration to push his fortunes in the court of claudius where wives and freedmen ruled he kept the effigies of pallas and narcissus among those of his household gods and carried one of Messalina's slippers in his bosom to have the pleasure of kissing it in public. He rose to be thrice consul, and the admiring senate had graven on his statue in the forum the words which told of his unswerving loyalty toward his prince. The son followed in his father's steps and pandered to the vices of three emperors in turn. As a youth he shared the sensual orgies of Tiberius at Capri, he pleased Claudius by his skill at dice, and Nero by using a show of force when he was too shy to sing in public. In the province of Africa he bore a better character as proconsul, but as commissioner of public works at Rome he was said to have filched the gold out of the temples and replaced it with ornaments of baser metal. Yet on the recall of Virginius he was sent by Galba to command the camp in Lower Germany men thought the appointment strange enough some said he owed it to a favourite's caprice some fancied that he was chosen from contempt as too mean and slothful to be dangerous in command he was the greatest glutton of his times had eaten all his means away and had to leave his family and hired lodgings and to pledge his mother's jewels to pay the expenses of his journey but he started in the gayest mood made messmates and friends of all he met, and did not stay to pick and choose. His low pleasantries and jovial humor charmed all the muleteers and soldiers on the road, and in the camp he was hearty and affable to all alike, was always ready to relax the rules of discipline, and seldom took the trouble to refuse a prayer. The army saw in him a general who was too liberal and open-handed to wish to stint them to their beggarly pittance, and keep them to task-work on the frontier. He would not try to curb their license or deny them plunder if they were once upon the march to Rome. Two leading generals, Fabius Valens and Alienus Caecina, saw in him also a convenient tool, whose very vices caught the fancy of the soldiers, and whose name would sound well in a proclamation, but who was too weak and indolent to wish to rule, and would be obliged to fall back on men of action like themselves. Both wished for civil war on personal grounds. Valens resented bitterly the neglect of the good service rendered by him to Galba's cause. Caecina had just been detected in a fraudulent use of public money, and would soon be called to an account. Within a month, a crowd of soldiers gather at nightfall round their general's tent, force their way into his presence, and carry him upon their shoulders through the camp, while their comrades salute their new emperor with acclamations. The legions of the upper province were already in open revolt, and soon broke the idle oath of allegiance to the senate, and joined their comrades of the lower Rhine. The two armies under Valens and Caecina pushed forward by separate routes to cross the Alps. Their track, was marked by license and by rapine. The frightened villagers fled away, the townsfolk trembled lest their riches should tempt the soldiers' greed, or jealous neighbors vent their spite in treacherous charges, and were glad at any cost to purchase safety from the leaders. Caecina was the first to front the foe, but was beaten off from the strong walls of Placentia after a vain attempt to storm it, which caused the ruin of the amphitheatre, the finest of the kind in Italy, and the pride of all the townsmen. Valens, however, was not far behind, and the two armies, once united,
crushed the badly handled troops of Otho in the victory of Bedriacum near the confluence of the Adua and the Padus. Vitellius was in no mood to hurry. He was very well content to move in pomp and triumph on the road, or float at ease along the rivers while his guards did the fighting. The provincials vied with each other in their eagerness to do him honour, and they found that the one passport to his favour was to provide abundance of good cheer. He was glutton and epicure in one. The countries through which he passed were drained of all their choicest, costliest viands, and every halt upon the way was the signal for a round of sumptuous banquets, which never came too fast for his voracious appetite, while his train of followers gave loose to insolent license, plundering as they went and quarrelling with their hosts, and Vitellius only laughed in uproarious mirth to see their brawls. The rude soldiers of the north settled like a cloud of locusts on the fair lands of Italy. Cornfields and vineyards were stripped for many a league upon their way, and towns were ruined to supply their food. Pillage and riding took the place of the stern discipline of frontier armies, and camp followers ravaged what the soldiers spared. Even in the streets of Rome, the quiet citizen stood aghast as the wild-looking troops came pouring in, the untanned skins of beasts upon their shoulders, their clumsy sandals slipping on the stones. But the soldiers were in no mood to brook a curious stare or a mocking jibe, for a blow soon followed on a word and bloody brawls destroyed the peace of the streets where they were quartered. Caecina, with his cloak of plaid and Gallic trousers, had little of the Roman general's look, nor did men eye his wife with pleasure as she rode by on her fine horse with purple trappings. With them in military guise came the new master of the world, the soldier's choice, with the drunkard's fiery face and weak legs that could scarcely carry his unwieldy frame. He now returned in state to the city from which he stole away but lately to avoid importunate creditors. His first care was to pay honour to the memory of Nero, and to call at a concert for the song that he had loved, as if he saw in him the ideal of a ruler. But the substance of power passed at once out of his feeble hands. The generals who had led his troops governed in his name, while Asiaticus, his freedman, copied the insolence of the favourites of Claudius. Their master, meantime, gave all his thoughts to the pleasures of the table, inventing new dishes to contain portentous pasties to which every land must yield its quota, and spending in a few short months nine hundred million sesterces in sumptuous fare. But he had no long time to eat and drink undisturbed. Within eight months the armies of the East took the oath of allegiance to Vespasian, and the legions in Mesia and Pannonia, which had not been able to strike a blow for Otho, were ready to avenge him by turning their arms against Vitellius. The main army of the enemy indeed was slow to move, but Primus Antonius, a bold and resolute officer, pushed on with the scanty forces that lay nearest on the road to Italy and reached Verona before a blow was struck. He might have paid dearly for his rashness if the generals of Vitellius had been prompt and loyal. But their mutual jealousies caused treachery and wavering counsels in their midst, and all seemed to conspire to help Vespasian. The air and luxury of Rome had done their work upon the vigour of the German legions, and their morale had suffered even more. The auxiliary forces had been disbanded and sent home, recruiting had been stopped for want of funds, furloughs were freely granted, and the old praetorians had been broken up and were streaming now to join Antonius. The Atesian winds, which were blowing at this time, wafted the ships toward the east, but delayed all the homeward bound, so that little was known of the plans and movements of the enemy, while it was no secret that the forces of Vitellius were daily growing weaker, and that Caecina was chafing visibly at the rising popularity of Valens. The fleet at Ravenna was the first to declare against Vitellius, for their admiral, Lucilius Bassus, had failed to gain the post of praetorian prefect, and was eager to avenge the slight. 
caecina who was taking the command in the north of italy tried first to let the war drag slowly on and then to spread disaffection in the ranks and to raise the standard for vespasian but the soldiers had more sense of honour than their leaders hearing of the plot they rose at once threw caecina and some others into chains and fought on doggedly without a general the crash of war came a second time upon the plains of bedriacum where after hard fighting the legions of germany were routed and flying in confusion to their entrenchments at cremona brought upon the unoffending town all the horrors of havoc and destruction even amid the scenes of that year of strife and carnage the fate of cremona sent a thrill of horror throughout italy so suddenly came the ruin on the city that the great fair held there at that time was crowded with strangers from all parts who shared the fate of the poor citizens at a hasty word from their general antonius who said that the water in the bath was lukewarm and should be hotter soon the soldiers broke all the bands of discipline and for four days pillaged and burnt and tortured at their pleasure till there was left only a heap of smoking ruins and crowds of miserable captives kept for sale whom for very shame no one would buy vitellius meanwhile had hardly realized his danger till the news came of the treachery of caecina and the disasters at bedriacum and cremona even then at first he tried to hide them from the world and to silence the gloomy murmurs that were floating through the city the enemy returned to him the scouts whom he had sent but after hearing what they had to tell in secret he had their mouths stopped for ever a centurion julius agrestus tried in vain to rouse him to be stirring and volunteered to ascertain the truth with his own eyes he went returned and when the emperor affected still to disbelieve he gave the best proof he could of his sincerity by falling on his sword upon the spot then at last vitellius summoned resolution to raise recruits from the populace of rome and to call out the newly levied cohorts of the guards he set out at their head to guard the passes of the apennines but he soon wearied of the hardships of the field and came back again to rome to hear fresh tidings of treachery and losses and to be told that valens had been captured in the effort to raise gaul in his defence and to feel that his days of power were numbered in despair at last he thought of abdication and came to terms with vespasian's brother flavius sabinus who had long been prefect of the city in a few hopeless words he told the soldiers and the people that he resigned all claims upon them and laid aside the insignia of empire in the shrine of concord but the troops from germany who had felt their power a few months since could not believe that it had passed out of their hands and they rose in blind fury at the thought of tame submission they forced vitellius to resume his titles and hurried to attack sabinus who with some of the leading men of rome and a scanty band of followers was driven for refuge to the capital there they found shelter for a single night but on the morrow the citadel was attacked and stormed by overpowering numbers a few resolute men died in its defence some slipped away in various disguises and among them domitian the future emperor but the rest were hunted down and slain in flight in the confusion of the strife the famous temple of jupiter caught fire all were too busy to give time or thought to stay the flames and in a few hours only ruins were left of the greatest of the national monuments of rome which full of the associations of the past had served for ages as a sort of record office in which were treasured the memorials of ancient history the laws the treaties and the proclamations of old times the loss was one that could not be replaced but it was soon to be avenged antonius was not far away from the vanguard of vespasian's army messengers came fast to tell him first that the capital was besieged and then that it was stormed they were followed soon by envoys from the senate to plead for peace but they were roughly handled by the soldiers and musonius rufus of the stoic creed 
who had come unbidden with his calming lessons of philosophy found scant hearing for his balanced periods about concord for the rude soldiers jeered and hooted till the sage dropped his ill-timed lecture for fear of still worse usage vestal virgins came with letters from vitellius asking for a single day of truce but in vain for the murder of sabinus had put an end to the courtesies of war soon the army was at the gates of rome and scenes of fearful carnage followed in the gardens and the streets even of the city for the vitellians still sullenly resisted though without leaders or settled methods of defence till at length they were borne down by numbers while the population turned with savage jeers against them and helped to hunt them from their hiding places and to strip the bodies of the fallen when the enemy was at the city gates vitellius slunk quietly away in a litter with his butler and his cook to bear him company in the hope of flying to the south losing heart or nerve he had himself carried back again and wandered restlessly through the deserted chambers of the palace his servants even slipped away and he was left alone before long the plunderers made their way into the palace and after searching high and low found him at length hidden behind a mattress in the porter's lodge or as another version of the story goes crouching in a kennel with the dogs they dragged him out with insults and blows paraded him in mockery through the streets and buffeted him to death at last in the place where the bodies of the meanest criminals were flung to feed the birds of prey End of section sixteen